Hi everyone, so this is the pre-reading video for Muchness. Muchness is the ch second chapter of On Looking that I want you to uh, read. Um, and before we dive into it, there's a, a couple things I just want to show you. Uh, there's some places where I think that you might get confused, and I want to show you uh, uh, what those are. So, um, I have up here, uh, I haven't scanned the entire thing, um, but I have here um, uh, a couple of pages in. Um, this is actually on page, let me show you, uh, pages 22 and 23, at least on my version of the book, it's pages 22 and 23 uh, that we have here. Um, and she starts out this chapter of walking around the block with her son. So this is a, a book, as we said, is organized around walks that she is going to take around the same block with different people and to see what it is that they're going to be seeing. And again, I've asked you to kind of think about your own perceptions of things to say, look, uh, uh, you know, on your on your commute, what is it that you might notice that you haven't noticed before? And that's kind of what she's doing as she's walking around the block. What are the things that I might not be noticing? And if I walk around with different people, I might see different things. Uh, and then what kind of things might I learn from what I see? And so on this first walk, though, she's walking around the block with her son. The first couple of pages of the chapter, I think, are relatively clear. She's just walking around with her child. And if you've spent any time with children, that's something that you might potentially recognize how kids walk around, right? Uh, you can't get anywhere with kids really quickly because they stop and look at a lot of stuff, right? As we get older, we learn not to do that, right? Uh, we learn... Uh, uh, not to stop and look at every bug on the street or, you know, look at every flower or whatever it is that we're going, uh, that's, that we're going to pass by. We learn not to look at that because we never get to work. Uh, but uh, um, children are going to, you know, they don't have to go to work. So, and on some level, their job is to kind of take in information, to learn things. Uh, and they learn things by observing. And I will contend that one of the things that we you know, lose that uh, lose as we get older is our ability to just look at things around us and see what we can learn from them. And that's what I want us to potentially be writing about. Um, so uh, uh, she walks around with her son, and her son keeps stopping and looking at things. And then what she does is says, "Look, let me think about what that means psychologically and and physically. What's going on in his brain?" that allows him to see the world in this particular way versus what's going on in my brain. And so she uses this as an opportunity to ask some questions about how it is that we all actually experience the world. And so I think that's one of the places that you we might get confused in this because it seems like we're just walking around the block with a kid and then suddenly we start talking about a lot of other things that might be a little bit more confusing to us, It'll be a little bit more in depth. But understand that that's what she's doing. She's taking this basic observation of walking around the block with her son and saying, there's something else to be learned here. So uh, here on 22, she's going to be talking about uh, some of the things that her son's going to see. As we, he walks around, she says that he pays attention to light bulbs. Uh, he pays attention to every letter O. He's young enough. He's just learned what the letter O is, so he sees it everywhere, right? Um, and uh, uh, in, in all kinds of places that she doesn't necessarily notice. He also, uh, at the end of this paragraph here, is going to notice a lion. It says, he has shared the feature of our building that to him distinguished it from its neighbors, the lion's head in mid-roar above our entrance. Uh, I had never noticed it over thousands of entrances and exits. So she's going to say there's this you know, little sculpture. You might have seen them in, in, uh, if you live in apartment buildings, you see them around New York City, little sculptures in various places on the building. And she's going to say that there was a sculpture of a lion there. She never noticed it all the time she walked in. Um, her son is going to notice it. Um, and so she's going to say, well, that's kind of interesting. Why have I not paid attention to this thing that on some level is pretty obvious that this uh, a very small child has paid attention to? Uh, she asked the question, was he fixated, obsessed, that is he, you know, unnaturally connected to these things? Uh, a light bulb, letter O, or lion, was he a light bulb, letter O, or lion savant? A savant is somebody who is particularly good at something, right? Was he re just really good at letter O's, and that's why he did that? Was he just really good at understanding lions? Is that why he understood the lions? She says, no, my son was but an infant. He was only an infant. 
and the perceptions of infants are remarkable. So she's going to think about how is it that infants perceive things and say that there is something remarkable about that if we pay attention to it. Uh, the, that infants reliably develop into adults who for all their wisdom and kindness are often unremarkable blinds us to that fact. That is, it's remarkable to be, well, to be a child. What uh, uh, infants and children can do is remarkable. So we get you know, normal adults. We don't, we, most of us don't do much that's that interesting. Um, and so we forget how difficult and how amazing it is uh, for children to be able to learn about the world. Um, she says, uh, the infant's world is a case study that is a thing that you can look at, uh, you know, study to help us tell us about the world, a case study in confused attention. And so what does she mean by confused attention? We can go on to the next sentence. A newborn freshly plopped into the world, they're come, come out of their uh, mother's bodies, um, is unwittingly, uh, that is, they don't realize that this is happening, so it's unwittingly happened. They unwittingly enrolled in a crash course in sensory experience. They haven't had any sensation inside of their mother's bodies, but suddenly, boom, there's a lot of sensations that they're going to have. And so um, she's beginning to think about what that means for children to be born and begin to uh, experience sensations in the world. Uh, in some respects, his biology takes care not to overwhelm him too much. Though all sensory organs, and here she's going to list those organs, including those compellingly large, naive eyes, the ears the size of hands, the perfectly soft, unblemished skin, uh, those are the organs. Though all those organs are intact, the messages they receive from the world do not all get to the infant's brain, right? It might be overwhelming, right, for them to get all of that, at least not in an organized way. What the infant sees, for instance, is something quite fuzzier and more dazzling than a normal adult sees. Uh, babies are very nearsighted, they only see what's close to them, and they lack the clouded filters that take bright light down a notch, right? So they aren't able to say, wait a minute, it's too much light in here, let's kind of make this dimmer. They aren't able to do that. Uh, even more critically, the world is not yet organized into discrete objects uh, for these new eyes, discrete, not into individual objects. Uh, uh, that's what it means to be discrete. It is all light and dark, shadow and brightness. To the newborn infant, there is no crib, no mama and daddy, no floor, no wall, no window, my, no sky. Much of this can be seen, but, but none can yet be made sense of. So she's going to say that infants don't uh, experience objects in the same way that we do. It's just like this blur of light and dark, right? They don't understand there's one object, there's another. Uh, they don't really understand that they're separate from the world. They think that they're just part of all of this thing. And so uh, um, they have a very different sensory uh, uh, experience of the world. And she's going to, so she's gotten into some rather complicated stuff here, but she's trying to say, how is it that a child's brain actually sees things? She's taking this walk with her child and sees what he sees and, uh, you know, experience what the things that he sees and is saying, what can I learn from that, right? Many of us, again, have spent time with children. We've seen what children do, but we haven't necessarily thought about it. And that's what she's going to be doing uh, uh, in this chapter here, is kind of getting into some um, uh, some details about that experience. Um, uh, she then goes on to talk about something called uh, synesthesia in here. Um, and synesthesia has to do with the sense of experiencing uh, um, uh, things in two different sensory ways. And so um, she's going to give uh, uh, some examples uh, of this. Um, she's going to say things down here um, uh, 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 for synesthesias, for this person that, that is a synesthete, uh, this person experiences that sounds come in colors and flavors right? Pink, rough, or tasting like pickles. She says, many synesthetes, people who have this, this uh, condition, experience numbers and letters with distinctive overlays. A gloomy number three. The letter H has a drab shoelace and an A reminiscent of red weathered wood. You don't think an A is like weathered wood, right? A letter three is gloomy. Um, uh, people who have this condition of synesthesia are going to uh, experience those things, right? They're going to take these things like a letter, a number, or something like that, and have some other kind of sensory experience. And so what she's talking about from the top of this page in here 
is the way that infants are going to experience the same thing, right? Um, she's going to say that um, a teddy for them, a teddy bear. Sorry, this thing's uh, going on here. A teddy bear may be experienced as a bang or a ringing or a whisper, right? Um, because they're not able to connect up. Here's the object that I'm seeing with an experience, right? Uh, those things aren't, aren't completely connected. So this becomes a rather complicated way that we're beginning to think about the world. But the re and, and so some of this part might get confusing to us, but you want to recognize that the reason she is talking about that is because she wants to understand how an infant's brain operates. And the reason she wants to understand how an infant's brain operates is so she can then begin to understand how the the rest of the brain operates. How is it that she is going to experience the world? And so this, uh, um, all of this uh, um, uh, part in here that gets uh, uh, how um, these complicated ways in which people experience the world is all meant to help us understand uh, uh, that uh, uh, that larger idea there. Okay. Um, and so uh, uh, she's going to say that, in fact, we all kind of do this. She's going to mention uh, a German psychologist of the early 20th century called this thing that we have a sensorium commune. Um, that's just a name that he has, which is a primordial that is an ancient way that we have, something that's really old um, that you know, goes back to you know, uh, uh, when we were all just little bacteria or something swimming around. Uh, a primordial way of experiencing the world, pre-knowledge and pre-categorization. Uh, and so how would you experience the world if you didn't know what you were seeing, if you didn't know that there were objects, if you didn't know how to put objects into categories, um, if you couldn't look at things and say, oh, that's a book, that's a car, uh, uh, that's a television, those are people. If you didn't have that in your brain, what would you see? Um, and that becomes a really interesting question for us to begin uh, uh, to think about. She says, researchers have found remnants of this perceptual organization in adults being shown drawings of curly lines. Adults tend to categorize the lines as happy. They see a curly line and it looks happy. You're like, wait a minute, why is a curly line happy? They say that because, again, we kind of can uh, uh, make connections between shapes and feelings. Uh, that's still left in us. Descending lines are sad. Sharp lines are angry. Right, so she's going to uh, um, uh, talk about uh, uh, that idea there that we all have some element of that. Uh, children have it a lot more, and that's why her son might be experiencing this walk in the way that he's experiencing it. Um, but uh, um, uh, but we all have some of that, uh, and again, that might explain how we're going to experience the world. So I want you to understand what she's doing here. She's gonna. She's again the overall book, she is taking these walks and using this, them as an opportunity to begin to think about some deeper issues. And again, the reason that I want us to do this because I want you to think about how we can uh, look out at the world and say, this is just ordinary stuff here, and be able to say, well, wait a minute, there's something a lot deeper here. There's something that we can learn from uh, paying attention to things that we didn't uh, necessarily pay attention to at first. So uh, uh, keep that in mind. When you start to get confused about some of these things that get rather deep, start to think about how it is that they relate back to what's happening with her son walking around the block, that she's trying to make sense of that, trying to understand what's actually going on uh, in his head. She's going to be doing similar things like this throughout the book. As she goes through, she's going to see what other people are, are seeing and say, well, let's investigate that a bit more. Let's learn a little bit about that. Um, um, I asked you to do the writing assignment about the asphalt tags. You might have said, oh, there's just this plastic thing on, on the street, but if you understand what that is, you can understand it tells you something about how things get done in the city, how things operate. There's something to learn deeper about something that seems so small and so simple. So, uh, 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 and she's doing that with her child. Something so small and simple as how he sees the world and what can that tell us. So I want you to keep all that in mind uh, as you um, uh, read through muchness.